I am Rob, and today we have the character art director at NVIDIA, but he's a visual effects artist with 20 years of experience. I mean, this guy has done, I mean, if you've seen a movie in the last 20 years, there's a, a good chance you've seen some of his work. So Miguel Guerrero, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. No problem. Uh, just to, uh, before we get like super into it, I just want to call out, uh, a wall 152 followed yesterday or two days ago for some reason. I'm not sure why, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> welcome to, uh, to the show and, uh, grindhead Jim, uh, one of my big supporters, uh, is now hosting the stream. So thank you for that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and there's, oh my gosh, Nightbot. Nightbot's already causing trouble. <laughs> Jim said, uh, let's rock. So, uh, <laughs> and for some reason, Nightbot t uh, timed him out. So sorry for that, uh, Jim. There we go. Um, so first off, Miguel, uh, like first off, like the pandemic has been everything that, you know, we've kind of started every show talking about it just a little bit. Um, it's like, it's done some damage to every industry, but like, I'm kind of curious about like how it affected you, you know, is it like, if, has it been like, how has it affected you personally and how has it affected your work? Well, for me, I've, for the last year, uh, I've been, or year, almost year and a half, I've been working from home. So for me, it's kind of normal. The only thing that's really strange is not being able to go out with my kids to the park or anywhere. And that's just really weird telling your kids, hey, we can't go out because it's dangerous. And, you know, just being I... stuck at home, doing more home activities. But uh, in, in the industry that I'm in, more like the tech industry right now, it's actually the opposite. We're helping a lot with the coronavirus developments and that type of stuff. So if you look up what NVIDIA is doing, you can find out more. But yeah, for me, it's been, you know, just, um, you know, I'm already a homebody. I'm already just mm -hmm. home all the time. So for me, it's, it hasn't been too bad. That's good. I mean, like... Yeah. Oh, and there's the eagle has landed. That's my uh, that's my dad. One of my big my biggest supporters too. So uh, so hi there. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess like first off, before we get too far into the, like the interview interview, as a character art director, what does that mean exactly? It means a lot of things. Uh, making sure that. Uh, I guess Q&A has kept up with everything from the development of a character, whether it's from rendering to the look, to the anatomy, to, you know, for every, every single aspect of a, of a character. So I get to take care of that. And with the experience that I have from capturing to creating to having something on the screen, that kind of puts me in that, in that realm where I can kind of oversee all of it and make sure nothing gets out of hand or, or it doesn't work. That's cool. So, so in a way it's, it almost seems like, um, cause you were a, uh, I guess a character supervisor uh, at like Method, right? Is that is yeah. That... I've been a character supervisor at a couple of different uh, locations or a model supervisor. So it's making sure that everything has Q and A, everything is as good as it, it's, it's supposed to be, and make sure that everybody in the pipeline feels comfortable and everybody has everything they need. So I'm always in you know multiple parts of the pipeline from even sometimes from concept and ideas to the final thing where we're waiting for waiting for the final render. So you're kind of like you're kind of like the almost like a resource. At, at a, like almost every element of the of the process i guess you know you're just kind of overseeing and yeah making sure that everybody has everything they need to get their job done to the best ability they can cool yeah that's that's well that's really cool and i want to go more into that later but like many of us uh the terminator series seems to be one of your biggest <laughs> one of your biggest uh i guess uh inspirations at the beginning so like, how did, yeah, how did you, that was like my favorite movie. Like I watched that movie so many times and I always wondered like who, who does those special effects and how they do them. And, and, you know, I never thought it was possible for somebody like me to, you know, coming up poor and not a, you know, I, I didn't know anybody in the visual effects industry or anything like that. So it was like a, a dream of mine to one day figure that out. Or, or, you know, I always watch like the making of and see like, Oh, who are those people that are actually doing this? You know? And I, I, I dug deeper and deeper and then eventually found out that I'm one of those people. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I think that's, what's really cool about, again, many of the people that I've talked to on this show is that we get inspired by something, we start copying, and then we, we kind of, 
we kind of find our own voice, whatever that is, whether it's in 3D or if it's, you know, effects or sound or whatever. It's it's really kind of cool to see that those inspirations, it's like like you were inspired by the, the, the CG. Like me, I was inspired by the direction, like all of the cuts and all that stuff. I mean, the effects were amazing too. Don't, don't get me wrong, but it was like, it's just so interesting how those, how the same, it's almost like the same group of movies inspired a lot of us all at the same time in different ways. I just think that's really cool. So yeah, did, yeah, especially like, you know, stuff like Jurassic Park too, like that, that yeah. type of stuff, creature stuff. But for me, like the liquid metal, seeing that for the first time and seeing just uh, the whole film, like how well it was put together, it's like inspired me to like want to pursue more of this, you know, even though I'm not knowing where to even start, you know? Right. And then, so how did you get started? I mean, is it, did you start off, you know, like with, I guess, home 3D kind of things or did you, did you, did you start in a different way? So I was always drawing. I was never the best artist. I was always drawing, going to art classes when I was young, you know, and then uh, when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to like learn um, like AutoCAD, like learn uh, more, Mm. I guess, architecture type of stuff, you know, just by hand at first and then computer wise. And that's when I started digging deeper and there was like 3D Max. And they're like, we have 3D Max if you want to stay after class and like learn it. And I'm like, is that what they make movies with? And they're like, yeah, here's the manual. Go ahead, figure it out if you want to figure it out. So I will stay after class every day and just try that out. And then I found out that like a couple, like during summer school, there was a couple of places that offered like basic 3D Max classes. So I would just go and take those. And then from there, kind of learn that if you keep going with that, you might actually be able to one day work on something 3D that might be on the TV show or a movie or something like that. And see, that's, I, well, and I, we had talked briefly right before the show that, that I had started kind of dabbling in 3D back in like 2005 or somewhere around there. And I was super like, I guess, intimidated by the tools. And there was no, I guess that's the beauty of the internet today is that there's so many different tutorials and streams that you can watch, including yours, um, that, you know, people can kind of, see how the how the uh how everything uh is made it's just really really cool yeah back in the days there was nothing you had to have like the super expensive computers to run the software and specific hardware and you know you had to go somewhere to learn this and now it's like yeah you can just download blender and learn it for free you don't have to buy anything which now, is awesome here's the and that's kind of interesting because you know in all of this like your your kind of your beginnings you didn't talk much about uh the art institute is it's it's weird it's like uh in a way the real world application and the real world experience i guess was more was that more helpful to you well so i went to these uh, little schools or little trade schools to learn things for three months six months here and there before going to the art institute like when i wanted to figure out like well what am i going to do after high school mm-hmm. and then the art institute came by one day and they were like well we make we, we make art right here's some of the stuff we make and one of the big things they made was uh for Batman, uh, for the first Batman movie, they made these McDonald's cups. They mm-hmm. had like the penguin and all these cool illustrations, like really cool artwork, right? And they're like, maybe one day you, if you guys draw and do all this artwork, you guys can do this type of artwork. This is a career. So I looked into that. And then as I was getting ready to leave high school, uh, I looked at they're starting to offer 3D. So I was like, oh, maybe I could make transition from learning 2D to 3D. And I did that, you know, I went to the school and they learned first, first we were learning like 2D animation stuff, fundamentals, and then we got to the 3D part. But the problem was that I guess that school offered a lot of stuff, but nothing, none of it was really good because it was just like an experimental type of program. So I had to actually go home and like learn more of this stuff by on my own and like, you know, just like read manuals and read buy books and, and just do trial and error type of stuff. And um, that's why I don't mention it a lot because it was good for the fundamentals, but like if I was going to do it again, I'd probably skip those that a lot of money that they will spend on that school and, and just probably just buy some tutorials and stay home and watch YouTube and just do it myself and practice every day. Well, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to ever say that people shouldn't go to school. I mean, it's one of those things where you, you know, you're exposed to a lot of things that you wouldn't have been exposed to normally, you know, That's and true. sometimes it's working with people that that does it. But at the same time. There's nothing I learned in college that I used in almost any job. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's one of those things where it really, it's almost like getting that degree is like just showing that you 
you can learn. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, well, the, the crazy thing about this career is that that degree doesn't matter at all. <laughs> you could be, you know, right out of high school and no 3D, and like as long as your artistic skills are good and you listen, then you can move on and learn and, learn, you know, get on the job and be an intern and, and learn more about this stuff. Where like, yeah, you know, the degree was cool, but it was like not worth the money, you know, so, so expensive. I would say maybe taking workshops from different people that's where you go and meet other people that are interested in the same things. And maybe they have already have a job and you could talk to them more about things. So maybe spending your money more wisely mm. in smaller chunks so that you don't go broke. And then, you know, you're still trying to learn all this stuff. Now, and this is kind of going off script a little bit. Um, but I think that's one of the things, number one, um, here, I'm just going to put this in chat real quick. If anybody is yeah, interested, yeah. Um, go check out, uh, magvfx.com. And of course you can see his Instagram there as well, but Miguel's website has, I mean, not only can you see what you've done, which is again, impressive, but it's, it's the, the mentoring you do, the streams that you do that kind of cultivate like new artists. And I just think that that's, there's a humility there that I really am drawn to. And I just think it's really, really impressive. So anybody, anybody's interested, I trust me, you can get lost on there. It's, it's one of those things where like for me, I spent, I don't know how many hours going through your stuff and not just for the interview, but it was like, man, I want to watch him do this. Uh, like the, your ZBrush, um, you know, it's almost like you're kind of torn out and torn around with ideas and just seeing your thought process and things like that is fascinating. So, and then sometimes that's the main thing, right? Like sometimes it's it's a like you can learn the technique, but if you don't put it to use or know what's the thought behind it, like you can't move forward. So there's like the technique part and also the I guess the concept idea part. So you, both of those need to come together, or else you're going to be stuck. Yeah, and I think that's a big important thing. And also like the reason I started mentoring and started doing streams because it was something that I wish I had when I was coming up to be able to ask a professional artist something, you know, and then get the real answer as opposed to like something you read on the forum that this guy that never had any experience in any jobs in doing 3D is telling you how to do, but that's not how you do it in the industry, you know? Right. And that's what I liked about also teaching like at Nomen because it's like people that are doing these jobs on, you know, now it's not like you did, had a job 10 years ago and that's the only job you had. And all those techniques are outdated and like you're giving people the wrong information that are going to try to come up with the job. And now they they don't know what they're doing, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's funny that you say that though. It's like, man, asking for help on the internet can be, I mean, trying to filter out all the noise is very tough. <laughs> so, so no, I totally get that. And it's, I don't know. I just, I just think that's really cool that, that I guess this industry in a way, or I'd say the movie industry um, in particular, there's a lot of segments that are very protective of their knowledge. You know what I mean? And it's, there's a... And, and that's something that I came across when I was coming up my first like five years. People didn't want to share anything. People that have, they're on the jobs and you're, you're interning or you have your first job and you're asking them questions. They're really protected about like, oh, I can't show you because then you're going to take my job. And I think that's the m bad mentality to have because it's like, if you teach this person, maybe that helps you to know like, do you really know this stuff? And also how well do you know it? And if, you pass that knowledge, maybe you need to move on to more, you know? And that's one thing I know we we're talking about education and not, um, I, I, I'm always learning. I'm always taking classes. I'm always learning even up to this stage because there's always new techniques or new ways of looking at things, you know, that really help you save you literally months of work when it could take a week or a day, you know, or right. one click, save you hours. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a good thing to, cause it's like, it's almost like, um, in a way, to me, it's like when I review a movie, right? Sometimes it helps to contextualize what you actually think about it and what you know about it when you're trying to tell someone else about it. And it's one of the things that I thought was really helpful because sometimes I would, I would realize that my logic was faulty or that, you know what I mean? So I, yeah, yeah. I totally see the benefit in that. Um, in a way, I, I, I get that kind of, it's almost an ego thing right? It's like, it's like, um, you know, well, I'm the, I'm the, the, the sole 
knowledge here and you're the apprentice and I don't want the apprentice to be better than me. You know what I mean? But at the same time, and a lot of people have that mentality and it's like, why, why, you know, like it only makes you better for teaching somebody. Cause maybe that person could come they one day teach you something that you didn't know that could save you a lot of time or a different way of doing things, you know? Right. Yeah. Because sometimes it takes someone that doesn't know to ask the question that makes you rethink your process. Yeah. Yeah. Different perspective of like, well, how come we don't do it this way? And you're like, Oh yeah. Like I never even thought of that because I've been stuck in my workflow the way I think should work when, yeah. you know, and that's one thing that I move on. A lot. I moved around a lot of different companies and that taught mm. me a lot about how different people, uh, I guess, work, you know, and like learn things and like teach you things. And like, and that helped me a lot to see like how I can help other people as well. Yeah. And that's, that's something I wanted to bring up too, because I hope you don't mind this analogy, but that's kind of what I do. <laughs> it's one of my, it's one of my things. I love to, you know, kind of put it into context, at least for me, but the way that you're doing that, the way that you, it, I guess the way that you move around and you don't allow yourself to be too comfortable reminds me of a mixed martial artist. Some of the best, best mixed martial artists in the world, they go from camp to camp. And sometimes you hear the news, oh yeah, so and so is going to, the, you know, they've left their camp that they've been for. And it's like, at first you're like, why would they do that? But then it, it broadens their, their knowledge. And then again, in them teaching others, the knowledge just continually does this, you know? And that's, ex yeah, that's exactly, that's a really good way to look at it because it's like, yeah, sure. You're a black belt at this company, but you go somewhere else and now all of a sudden you're not <laughs> right. You know? Right. And I think that's right. what keeps you like humble and like keep wanting to hustle, you know, like for, or at least for me, I'm a, I love knowledge. So I want to keep learning. And like, if there's a better way or a different way, why is it better? Why is it not better? And compare them. And if you have a pool of different things that you can compare things to, then you can find better solutions quicker. Is that something that you like, is it, I mean, I'm not saying struggle because I don't think you struggle with it, but is, do you, every now and then, does your ego come into play or do you, or do you, are you constantly? Oh, so I always, may, I make sure to take my ego out. No ego can be there because the, as soon as the ego shows up, then it's always a, a pissing contest, you know? Yep. And I feel yep. like that's like, it cannot be there. If it, that's the first thing I do. As soon as I step into a class and I'm teaching somebody or I'm talking to somebody, no matter how advanced or how basic you are, like in your knowledge, there's no ego. I talk to you like we're both in the same level because that makes you feel comfortable. Now you can ask me questions that you wouldn't have asked me because you feel like, okay, he's going to give me the right answer or he's going to give me the, not the right answer, but like an honest answer, you know? And right. if I don't know something, I will tell you, I don't know. Let's figure it out together. And then we could figure it, you know, troubleshoot it together. And I think a lot of it's about the troubleshooting, you know? Yeah. And that's, I think that's kind of cool because in a lot of ways, I mean, for those of us who've, you know, been lucky enough to work on a movie every day is like that. It's constant troubleshooting. It's okay. Well, this isn't exactly what we expected. So how do we, how do we get around it? And I think that's really cool, especially when it comes to model design, you're doing it, you're doing it all in one place, you know, on a computer, you're not having to, you know, wrangle a bunch of people together or whatever, but you're still having to deal with those same sorts of issues. I just think that's really, that's awesome. Right. And that, and that's the, that's a good analogy because like there's been places where you go like your ILMs or your big places where you get every single piece of data you need to create a digital human or create a spaceship or whatever. Right. You have every single measurement or even the blueprint. And then there's places where you have none of that and you still have to figure out how to make the same result. So like you have to be able to troubleshoot it because it's like, okay, if I had this layout, I could put it here and do this. But if I don't have that, how do I figure that out? You know, like, how do I, do I need to go to a place and measure? Do I need to find a replica of it? Like whatever it is to figure it out, you know? Now, let me ask this. This is completely off again. <laughs> I keep thinking of things that like, like, oh man. Are good. <laughs> um, so in model design or whether it's, you know, uh, like a anthropomorphic or if it's a, a robot or whatever. Do you get to that point where is it really about how much time you have? Because I mean, like, there's a lot of I think the, I think at least in my mind, true artists they they're never satisfied like a hundred percent. It's you... it's really about the budget. Ah, it's about okay. the time and the budget. It's like you have two weeks. You need to make this look as good as possible. You know, maybe it's not the best design because you had to take shortcuts here and there, but it's what it's going to go out. You know. 
I, and, and it sucks sometimes because you know it could be better, but it's a business and it has to, you know, that that machine has to keep moving. It can't stop for you because you're like, it could be better, you know? Right. Do you, and I, I think, I just, I don't know. I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, you hear like George Lucas was never happy with the Star Wars movies. I mean, he was constantly tinkering with it. And it's just kind of interesting that in a lot of ways, you guys are the same way. You have to, you have to take all that ego and the, oh, it could be better. I could do this better. I, you know, and do you ever like, and I'm sure this is one of the things, do you ever think like a month later, you're like, man, I could have done it this way and it would have been so much more efficient. Or... Yes, there's always there's always that like oh it could have saved me three days of work and I could have put those days to more quality work as opposed to less technical work. Yes, there's always that, but that's what you take to the next job, right? So if another job mm -hmm. similar comes in, you know, like last time it took me this long because I did this. If I take this shortcut, that's better. It's gonna give me a better result with better quality. You know, that's yeah, that's really cool. Um, in regards to that, I guess in the like concepting, all the way through to the end the end process or the end result. How often do you, cause I'm, I've seen that. I mean, again, please, if you haven't seen his website, go look at his collectibles. The La Bestia is, I, again, I'm going to spend a lot of money. I can see it. But anyway, how often do you do that? Do you 3d print or do you sculpt like in clay and things like that? I mean, is that something that's helpful to your process? Yes. So like doing clay is one of the, biggest things that help me see the forms in real life you know because sometimes there's things in the computer where you'll get a, a 3d scan or you see a photo and you think it's a certain way but then you see it in real like specifically i used to do like life sculpting of models and you move the light around and all of a sudden you see a form that was not showing through a, you know mm -hmm. like something on the lip that you're like where's that bump coming from now it's there it wasn't there a minute ago and it's because you're actually moving lights around the actual object and that helps a lot to develop your eye and i think that's something that a lot of I guess 3D artists don't do because it's either they don't like it, they don't want to get dirty. But for me, I grew up in there, like, you know, like seeing the special effects of the real traditional guys. And I was like, I want to do some of that too. But I, that, that part is kind of like dead now, you know, mm -hmm. but I still do it. I still try to practice it as much as I can. So even when I 3D print something, uh, well, the first time I 3D printed something like, uh, like 2004 or something like that, I saw it in the computer. It looked great. And then I 3D printed it and like, it was like elongated because a lot, the lens on the, on the computer was lying <laughs> to me. So it was not right. And that's when I learned everything you need to do, even if it's a rough version, 3D printed, look at it and be like, okay, change it. Don't be married to it. You know? Now is that, I can see how, do you, have you ever, <laughs> this is just because I'm, I'm curious about 3D printing, but do you ever find yourself limited by the, like the, I guess the print head? Like do, does it, or do you try to print it large enough that, those kinds of things aren't as a big of a deal. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm making Yeah. Sense. So I have two different, I have a couple different types of printers, like the filament ones where like mm -hmm. it's, there's no, there's no detail. And then there's the resin ones that are more detailed. So I have mm -hmm. both. So I do my rough major changes in the, in the filament one to see it in light. And then if I need to print something more detailed, I just print it in the other printer. Oh, okay. Cool. Like when I call it final, I guess it's like the rough draft and like the final will be more detailed. And how long, like, I guess in your, in your journey as an artist, and I know you, you said that you don't think of yourself that way, but how long have you been doing that? I mean, I feel like that, that tactile is, it's even the, the methods that you're using, you know, with your hands, you can apply that to your, to your art in the computer as well. But that, right. like how long? So it's been like the last 10 years where like 3d printing has come into play before it was mm -hmm. like more like sculpt it in clay and reverse it, like scan it and mm -hmm. then get the imperfections that way where now it's like the last seven to 10 years has been like just 3D printed. It used to be really expensive. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you could have printers of your, your, you know, for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. So like, why not, you know, especially once you do one, once you do your first one, it's like, it's like you're hooked and then you yeah. want to print everything, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's what, uh, one of my friends has one and he, 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 he's, he's always printing something. And it's like, there was one where, uh, he said, uh, he said, yeah, the, he went over to his buddy's house and the door wouldn't close all the way or something that there was some sort of latch. And he goes, Hmm. And he, and he looked at it and he goes, I'm going to print you a, a lat, a, like a fix. And it's like, I, I wonder if that's just one of those things where I'd, there'd be constantly, you know, uh, like orange crap everywhere, you know, cause I got, you know, it's just like, <laughs> no, it definitely opens your eyes to things that you didn't think were even possible, you know? Yeah. And that's what the amazing thing of, that's the reason I do my own collectibles. Cause it's like stuff that. 
I would like like to see in the movie or like like to just make and like well nobody's gonna make it so I'm just gonna make it myself you know and put it out in the world and somebody likes it great if not at least I let put it out there yeah that's yeah I, I think that's really again guys <laughs> you gotta go see some of this stuff it's amazing um and I guess when it comes to those sorts of especially some of your artwork on there there's a there's a i guess a really cool mix of like organic versus like like a man-made type surfaces and things like that like especially that what is it the alien mech i love oh, because yeah. it's it's very organic but then there's these hard surfaces and these i just really like that so like what inspires that is it is and i i know that you've said that you you definitely do a lot of observing of people of the of nature of like like talk about that a little bit and and how that kind of inspires uh, you yeah for me it's mostly insects i love insects you know i used to be scared of them growing up because i I live in the city and there was no insects and then if you (laughs) saw one you're like i don't know what to do with it you know um but i started collecting insects a few years ago probably like 10 years ago now i have a huge collection so I look at that and I try to figure out how can I make that into something that's kind of a anatomy, like a human to make it work. So that's why you see a lot of things that are kind of like half, half organic and half mechanical. Cause I'm always trying to integrate that into, into my designs, you know? Yeah. I think that's, I just love that. I mean, it's, there's a, there's a familiarity to it, even though it's very, it's very, some of them are very strange, but there's now, now let me ask this with your, your sensibilities, I guess, uh, your likes, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. do you like the, the kind of the super horror type stuff or do you like, like, I guess I find that interesting when, like for me, I love all kinds of movies and all kinds of, uh, I guess different designs and stuff, but I'm really, when you see some effects that are really done well, like the thing, is one of my still one of my favorite movies just because it's so strange and is it like do you how do you get into that mindset or is it just it's just like a natural ah let's try this no i i love a lot of that stuff so i i feel like before like you know at least growing up it was like you had to only like one thing like oh you're a jason fan or a freddy cougar fan or one of those right. things right but yeah. i feel like i'm a fan of everything so like you never know when something's going to come into play like an alien or a- aliens you know or or something different. So I, I try to mix everything up because it's only what inspires me that, you know, I have like, if you look around, there's all kinds of Star Wars stuff. There's like original things. There's like stuff from different conventions or different artists and different styles. And that for me, that helps me kind of just open my brain to like, okay, maybe this could be more photo real, but in the more cartoony world or more photo real in the mm. more different type of world. So I try not to limit myself. I just look at everything, even from flowers to insects, to people's skin and pores and, I'm always looking at this stuff, you know? I love that. That It was one of your interviews where you were like, you were talking about how you were just staring at somebody and they're like, what? And I'm like, oh, sorry. I was just looking at your skin. <laughs> just well, it's me funny, up. right? Because there, there's <clears throat> things that I don't talk about. Like uh, like recently, probably this, this past year, I went to a facial facelift. Uh, I, went, I, I was able to sit in surgery and look at that for like six hours. And that's something that people usually wouldn't do. But they're like, why, would, why are you interested in this? It's like, I want to know more about people's faces, you know, which is awesome. It's like, people are like, how can you sit there and see all the blood? It's like, I just can't. I just, for me, it's reference. It's not like gross or, or whatever. It's just like more things for me to like, think about fat, how much fat there's on people's faces and things like that. You know? Yeah. That's it's, I guess it's almost, it's almost like a reverse surgery in a way. Like a lot of what you do is you're, you're basically forming using, especially like when it comes to faces and things like that, you're, you're, you're really getting in there and, and forming that, I guess the structures and stuff. So I guess this leads to another question about, I guess your process when it comes to um, skeletal structure and things like that. Like when you were at that, uh, that ZBrush summit with Leo, which was, I loved, um, it was just, I just found it fascinating, even though, I don't know exactly what you're doing and how you're doing it. I, 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 I understand the concepts and what you're trying to, to get across. So when you're starting with a, with a model or let's say, you know, a movie or whatever, and they're saying, we want this, 
how do you make the decision to start with something to modify something you've already made or to start fresh? Is it time? Well, that's the thing, right? Like on my website, there's a lot of things that are organic, but before that I was doing a lot of things that were not organic. So I, I have a wide spectrum of, of things that I worked on. So I guess the easiest way to look at it was like, I was working like of one of the Fast and the Furious movies and they're like, we need to create this car. And it's like, most people would be like, well, okay, it's just a car. Give me a picture. I'm just going to look at the exterior. For me, it's like, no, what, what year was, what, was it modified? Was it not modified? What kind of engine did it have? What kind of seats? Is it for racing, not for racing, for drifting? So you look at the type of wheels, the kind of tires it has. So you go deep into this stuff, you know? And it's the same thing with the human body, right? Is, or, or animals. Like, oh, if I'm making this creature that doesn't exist, is he more like a hippo? Is he more like a rhino? Is he more like what ostrich? Like what kind of, what kind of things? So I could have something to, I guess, anchor myself into reality. And from there, break it down to like why it moves that way, you know? If it needs to run fast and attack, Maybe and it's only on two legs. Maybe it's more like an ostrich. So what makes an ostrich an ostrich, and why does it have a certain muscle? So then you go deeper into that, you know, and then you find out there's subcategories of those things, and then subcategories of those things, and you can go as deep as as tissue and all kinds of stuff. But you know, that's kind of what I'm always thinking about, and that's the nice thing about 3D that you could go deep. You know, if you have the time, you could go really deep, and that's something you should do because it's not just the surface. It's like what's informing the surface to be what it is. You know? Yeah. Well, and then it's kind of like, it's almost like most people that aren't 3D artists or, or you know, muggles, as Leo said in one of those interviews, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, we know we know good CG when we see it, and we know bad CG when we see it. We may not know why, but, and that maybe that's part of it, is that they're not thinking about mechanically, even, even on an organic body or an organic model that they're not thinking about how things move and how how the how the muscles uh you know morph and change as you know a leg goes up or an arm goes up and then how the or skin reacts too right you yeah. look at it and you're like why why can your arm not go past this point and it's like well because if not you're you wouldn't have a clavicle you yeah. know so sometimes when people start breaking those things those like laws of physics then you're like something looks off but you don't know why but you know something's off and yeah. exactly not having those understandings of what's happening inside it's what's like making things look weird and you're you don't know why but it just doesn't look right yeah see i just think that's the the fact that i i guess that's one of the things that's always impressed me about effects in general is that unless it's a unless it's a poorly made movie where you know to me it's like effects are never the reason right you can't right. you can totally tell a story using effects but if if it's just effects for effects sake then it doesn't work because the story is the is what drives the you know the effects are part of that so the, right it should never be driven by the effects ever but there's so many movies that are they're just yeah. like a flat shiny little thing that people are like oh it's gonna make a great movie it's like no because the story sucks <laughs> yeah know? yeah but i guess that's what's impressive to me is that in any sort of effects you spend an incredible amount of time thinking about those kinds of things for what could be, you know, mere seconds of footage, frames of footage, and even a lot of or cases. Or blur that you, if you blink, you don't see it. <laughs> yeah. And I just, it's, I mean, it's something that I've always appreciated because I'm seriously a huge movie dork and I've always loved all the special features. Like, I watch everything. I, I watch everything I can. Like, if it's a movie I love, especially... I'll watch every single thing. I want to learn how the costumes are made. I want to learn how all of these things are made just because I'm curious. But the it's one of the things that just really impresses me, especially like, I mean, just to go back to Yoshi for a second, when he was talking about his, his shots in, in Rise of Skywalker, it's like some of those are blink and you miss it. The detail that they spent, you know, some of some of the work that you've done, it's like, you can literally pause your demo reel, which we will look at here in a, a few minutes, if you don't mind. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, sound good. Um, the, you can just pause it and spend an infinite amount of time just looking around and going, wow, look at all of this. I just find that super impressive. And, and it's, it's, I have a tendency to be a bit hyperbolic on this show, but at the same time, I'm like, really love this stuff it's just i'm i'm super impressed with it um, well, and it's super fun to work on you know sometimes you spend months and 
almost a year sometimes working on a film and then like it flops or it doesn't do well but as long as you did your best you know to make it the best possible thing then that, that's all that matters at least for me it does like, you know putting it, everything you have and that's one of the things that i wanted to ask you about it's like for example rise of skywalker you know critically it didn't do well but then again yoshi's very proud of the work that he did so do you ever have a problem with that do you have a like being able to separate the, I guess, the reception of of the movie in itself versus the work that you did on it? Yeah, no, I, I don't have an issue with it. I think early on when I was coming up and I, I started working on a few things and it's like, oh man, I'm so proud of this. And like, it, it was a blur or like people are like, oh, it sucked. And, and I was like, oh man, is it my fault? And, and then you learn to be like, well, it, it was a content and it didn't come out at the right time or it wasn't the right thing to be out, but it, it's out and that's it. You move on, you know? Yeah. And that's, I mean, again, some of the work that you've done, it's like, especially when I saw you breaking down like the, uh, what is it? The teenage group in infinity war. And it was just like the thought that goes into, you know, the way that each, each root, you know, moves in, you know, in response to, you know, the action. And it's one of those things that you don't, I think that if you hadn't done that, like you showed the two examples of the movement. Right. And it's like, man, there's so much to appreciate. And yeah, there's like, those are the little things that bring things to life, you know, but yeah. if you don't have the time, you probably won't put them in if you're doing something like a TV show, but yeah. you can notice like the quality degrade, you know, like it becomes less believable, even though, you know, he's not, he's a tree guy, but it, it, ma- it makes you feel like, Oh, what is he doing? What is the extra little thing that's happening in that shadow? You know? Well, it's, it's given me a, like a whole new thing to look for because it's not something that I, I guess maybe because it just goes by so fast. I didn't notice that, but, um, it's, I don't know. I just think, I just think that's amazing. Now I do want to ask you kind of a, like an offhand thing. So I've got this. Um, so that's the hot toys, baby Groot. Nice. Um, now let me ask, do, and you may be able to answer this or not, but, is that something where you provide those files and then they kind of modify them for their, like the, the articulation and the joints and things like that? Or do you just, do they just have their own set of artists and things like that? It's a little bit of both. So there's times where we hand this stuff over, like we actually posed it like a Hulk or something like that and mm-hmm. then give it to them and it's like ready to go. But then there's times where like the hair was done realistically. So they have to resculpt the hair mm-hmm. or, or we give them the base model and they repose it and they do everything. So it's a, it depends on the company. Mm-hmm. but it has gone both ways where like they don't they're like just give us images we'll recreate it or here give us asset and then from there we'll, we'll modify it so yeah so it's a little bit of both i find that incredibly and it's something that i didn't realize until later on and i just started thinking about because that you basically was your group right i was looking at your group and thinking about it and then i'm like wait a minute i've got that baby Groot in there and then i started looking at it and i'm like i mean just seeing the you know the way that that things are put together. There's a seam right here where it snaps together. Right. So I'm like, now, wait a minute. Is this something that like, did they take your model? And then, I don't know. I just, I just find that incredibly. Yeah. There's been times where they have, yeah. I, I I spent a lot of time on, on baby group two for guardians, uh, the galaxy Mm two, uh, which, which, um, probably like two months, just figuring out how his plates on his face were going to move when he emotes. Like, do they slide out of mm. out of place and there's another plate underneath or do they stretch? Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm familiar with that guy too. <laughs> yeah, this is, and of course, this is one of those things about if if anybody out there, if you don't have the hot toys, um, some of the, the articulation is ridiculous. Like, I've never had a figure that moves like that. Just the top part of his chest moves. And it's just like, that is so cool. But it really, you know, spurned all of those thoughts in my head. I'm like, how? Like, I don't know. I could see how they could, you could do it both ways. You know, you could hand over the files and they kind of manipulate them for their use. Or they just kind of have their own set of artists. But man, Hot Toys are, I bet you Hot Toys uses a lot of your your stuff. Yeah, especially now that they're so like, uh, they could just, they use the same programs, you know, ZBrush. Yeah. So they could just take it and chop it up and use the parts they need and modify the parts they don't. So it's not a, it's not a completely different world. We're in the, we're in the same world. <laughs> right. Now, the, when did you, I guess, start getting into 
the the 3D collectible thing that that you've been doing on your website with the the La Bestia? Uh, probably about ten years ago. Yeah, I started really slow. I started out with clay because I was only able to do stuff. I didn't have a 3D printer, so I just started sculpting stuff and it's like making casts and molding and painting that stuff. And then when I was able to actually afford a printer, then I, I could just print my stuff, my own my own things, and then cast and mold them from there. It made it so much easier because then it's like, I already have a file that I like. I just need to modify it, print it, and it's done. You know, hmm. and, and, and it made it so much accessible with 3D printing, like being able to have this stuff at home. Man, I just had to learn the other hurdles like molding, casting, paint, airbrush painting, and all that stuff. And it's got to be really freeing too because, I mean, do you ever like get like, like, oh, we're we're making another, you know, like, I mean, like another rhino or we're making another, you know what I mean? Then when you get home. Yeah, eventually you get, you get to that point where you're like, you're like, okay, we just did this. How can I get the creative juices when I go home and make my own things? Yeah. Right. And that's the reason I started doing that because it was stuff that like, oh, we made a robot for this movie, but it was like kind of lame, like compared to like, what we could have done. So like, maybe I take some of these ideas and make my own robot for whatever I think it is. And then start printing my own stuff. See, that's, I, I think that's really cool because it's, it gives you that. I guess that outlet for your, for your creativity. But now here's, here's a question that's not on the list, but <laughs> how do you balance that with your home life with your, you know, cause you've got a, a daughter, right? I have two, two girls. Oh, yeah. Nice. So before that I would just come home and have dinner and just sculpt some more and then do it till midnight and go do it every day. And, you know, like spend some time with my wife, but you know, just uh, kind of weekends or whatever. But now it's been a lot harder because uh, I want to be a good dad. You know, I could be, I guess what I consider a shitty dad or like, <laughs> I know a lot of people like that. They're like, I don't care about my kids. I pay for them. Who cares? I have somebody else take care of them. I want to be, I want to be there for them. You know, I want them to see that I work hard. So like one thing I started doing with my daughter is like, I had to put her to bed and now that she's not going to school and kind of just taking it easy, I bring her with me at nights and have her see that I'm working on stuff, you know? And I think that, kind of opens her eyes to be like, oh, he's not just away doing nothing. He's working hard and making stuff. And in the last couple of weeks, she's, um, I started making toys for her, <laughs> you know? So she'll be like, oh, there's this cartoon that I like and they don't have the toys. And I go, okay, let's make it sit with me and tell me what you want me to shoot. I have her art direct me to be like, oh, here's the character I want you to make. And it's like, can you make the eye bigger, you know, smaller? So I started making stuff for her. See, that's, I just think that's cool. I mean, it's like, I mean, gosh, you've, you've got almost like from her perspective, she's probably like, my dad makes toys, you know, but it's, yeah. it really kind of all just works together. I just, I don't know. I just think it's really cool. Um, no, I figured that would be a good way for me and her to interact. And like, she could see that I'm doing stuff. I'm doing stuff for her. And we're all spending time together, but I'm still trying to get at least right. a little bit at a time, you know, even if I just spend 30 minutes a day, like after they go to sleep, I used to put in some time to kind of keep pushing my creative freedom out, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's great. I mean, it really is. And one of the things that I think, I guess we're going to kind of go into your, your, I guess, teaching and things like that. One of the most valuable things that I think that you've said, I'm not sure if you said it earlier on stream or if it was something we mentioned before stream, but that, you know, kind of uh, the Yoda thing, you know, the greatest teacher failure is, you know, just... I find that to be failure is something that's going to happen. And you say, don't be afraid of it. Yes. I'm a big fan of, of failing <laughs> because, uh, because you get all the mistakes out quickly, you know, and you try things and, and sometimes they go your way. Sometimes they don't, but you have to be able to move on and, and let it go and move on. And some people just get stuck and that's where they don't move forward, you know, like whether their career or life or whatever, you know? So it's like, yeah, it was bad let's try again. And, and I think that's what keeps me going. Like I was telling you earlier, like, I don't consider myself an artist. I just consider myself a guy that keeps trying, you know? And I just, and that's my major thing. I just don't give up, you know, maybe some days I give up a little because I'm tired, but the next day I come back and I keep pushing, you know? And that's one thing I try to push in my streams and people, and that's why I started doing streams. So people see that sometimes there's a design and now we're in, I'll just trash it and start a new one because I'll be like, you know what? It's going nowhere or let's trash half of it. And keep part of it and move on and not be scared to like not be scared to just start over if you need to well that that humility has got to be one of those things that has got has gotten you a long way and 
So one of the also the one of the things that you kind of have said that I really was like uh, <laughs> just stuck in my head was uh, you know don't be a dick. So yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So part of my job, I you know when I was coming up, there was people that were dicks, and I always said I'm never going to be like that when I when I when I get a better position. I'm not going to be like this person or that person because there were there were dicks and hard to work with and. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to work with them, but you have to because they're their supervisor, right? Yeah. So I, I always try to tell the people that I'm mentoring or people that are coming up, don't be a dick, you know, just be nice. And even if you might hate somebody and they, they're jerks to you, just look the other way and blow it off and move forward and don't be a dick. And that help, <laughs> that will get you pretty far in your career because you will, you see how many people throw tantrums and, and get upset about things when it's like, dude, we're not saving lives. We're not doing anything. We're just making pixels, you know? Right. So, like, But that... That's the thing, though, is like, especially for, I mean, let's be honest. For me, I was one of those guys growing up. I was always kind of, I had a big ego about, every, you know, just about anything. If I was, if I was just, just, just a little bit good at something, I'd have a big head about it. And it took me almost dying to realize, you know, to give me perspective and to know that, you know, a wise man knows that he has much to learn, you know? So... It's just, it's, I guess it's, it's fascinating to me <laughs> for the people that learn that without having to go through something so traumatic like I did. So I don't know. Yeah, Hopefully you don't have to go through that, but sometimes it takes that to wake you up and be like, oh man, I got to stop doing that. I got to stop drinking or I got to stop being a jerk or whatever, you know, yeah. because it's not good. But one thing that helped me was, you know, you get to like, you were talking about mixed martial arts or something right mm-hmm. earlier. And that's one thing that I, I learned early on that going from place to place from different company to company, I learned that sometimes the person that thinks they're a black belt in one company and they're like the master of what they do, you go somewhere else and they're like not even close to being a master. So that's kind of what humbled me to have an ego because it's like you come somewhere and you're like, I'm the new black belt. It's like, no, you're not. You you don't know what you're talking about. And then you learn and you're like, yeah, you're right. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me learn. You know, and then you go from place to place and you learn from people and it helps you realize that there's so much stuff that you don't know that you just got to stay humble and keep learning. Now, yeah, I mean, I, completely. But you, you got me thinking about something else, too. You're talking about, you know, you've moved from place to place. And you've done a lot of, I guess, supervising. How do you... How do you kind of cultivate them in a way that helps them grow? Because I, I, I would think that, you know, like certain project comes along you have to kind of figure out, okay, this person is good at, you know, character. This person is good at backgrounds. This good at, guy's really good at particles or whatever. Right. How do you figure out whether to push them by giving them something they're not good at and, or giving them something that is in their wheelhouse? You know what I mean? I talk to them. So mm-hmm. I go case by case and I actually talk to the person. So I'm very personal. I come up to you, ask you how you're doing, how's life, how's everything outside of work and what do you want to do and what do you want to get better at? And, and if you're honest, you could be like, well, I want to get better at this, but I'm not good at it. But, and if there's opportunity, I'll try to help you learn it, you know, and try to kind of baby step you into that so that you, you feel comfortable. And there's like, if you run into an issue, I can help you fix it and move on. And you learn from that experience, you know? So I try to, always ask people what they want because that's something that people don't ask. They just tell you and come in bark orders that you get this model done by tomorrow afternoon and it has to be done. But you're like, well, I need all these things or I need help or whatever. And you don't, you can't say that you just have to do it. Uh, so I, I ask people, what do you want to do and why you want to do that? You know, or are you okay doing what you're doing? And if you are, then that I just leave you alone, you know, but I try to figure out like what's going to make you happy. So you're not grumpy when you're at work. Right now. Can, can you just, I wish there was a way for you to take that out and give that to every boss in the world. <laughs> Cause that's the kind of thing that, you know, it's like nobody, it's like you, some people, they be, I mean, I'm sure you've met them. They become manager and they suddenly forget how to be what it was like to be, you know, answering to someone, you know, they suddenly yes, and think that's a big problem, right? Like all of a sudden they change personality and there's somebody else. And that's the main thing that I try to make sure that, if I ever got a better position that I would not change my, my values, you know, like I would still stay humble and stay, remember what, how I came up so that the, the things that people did to me that I didn't like, I wouldn't do to others. So people wouldn't hate me, you know? Yeah. 
As I just, I don't know. That's just like, <laughs> again, why, why can't right, every... believe me? It's really hard because sometimes people don't want to cooperate, but you just got to figure out how to, you know, how to work with them. I just can't, I like, why can't people understand that? Like, why can't people see that? But anyway, now, okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take, um, it's kind of a, for, for, I guess for you and me, Miguel, it's, it'll be kind of a break. Um, for okay. you guys, you're going to watch his demo reel. Now, the only thing I will say is that Miguel, the, uh, when I do that for some reason, I guess it's because of the way OBS direct, you know, does audio, your mic will still be hot. So, okay. Just to let you it's know, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we're just gonna, we're going to watch that real quick and guys, believe me, tune in and watch this. This is, uh, this is some amazing stuff. So we'll be right back. Wow. <laughs> I just, I, I've seen that thing. I've watched that so many different times, just looking at all the, the design work. It's just, it's very impressive. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I really. And it's so outdated too. I'm sorry that I don't have a new one. Cause uh, there's probably like 10 other movies that I could have put on there that, uh, you know, with the update. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally understand. Especially when um, like Yoshi and you have both kind of said that, you know, you kind of create demo reels on based on need you know if, if, if a yeah. company requires it but but yeah and i mean i gotta tell you guys if um you can get to it on his website but there's a, a link to the um the zbrush summit in 2018 and you do a little reel there and i know that might not all be your work but man it's just it's just so impressive you know it's just like no, thank you. How can I, it's, it's like, how can I not be hyperbolic <laughs> about some of this stuff? Cause it's just like, to me, it's, it's like, there's some of those designs. I can't even like, I can't even think that way. It's just, I don't know how to, I, I don't even know how to even ask a question about it because it's like, like, how do you ask an artist? Hey, how do you put the marks on the paper in the way that, I don't know, just weird. Now, yeah, no, I totally get it. <laughs> it's, it's, I guess that's the thing that once you get into it, you just start trying things. And then sometimes things like the, the whole thing about that almost, it's almost like that milky, the way that the, when the bullets hit, they kind of go through in kind of a, like that volume, that volumetric kind of, I don't know. It's just yeah. Cool. So that's working. So that's working with like different people, right? Like I'll create the model, but then somebody else explodes it. And that's their, they do, they're specialized in liquids and dynamics. So they help make your model look even better than what it was. You know, I just, I just find that stuff fascinating. I mean, I, I, I hope, I hope you guys are, you're enjoying this stuff too. It's just so cool. Now, uh, let me see here. Cause we've, we've, we've covered a bunch of this stuff, but I, this is a, a personal thing, but the vicarious video for tool, um, I'm a huge tool fan. I've been a tool fan for, you know, 20 years now. And the vicarious video is one that was always very memorable to me way before I even knew that you had worked on it. So I'm kind of curious about the design of that. Like was Alex Jones, like super like involved in the, in the kind of the, I guess the art design. Yes. Alex Jones and Adam Jones were, uh, or the drummer or the guitarist, uh, but yeah, it was great to have those two guys, to to have both of those guys there, you know, like the visionary guy that has all the repetitive stuff. He was so cool. Like he was like such a nice person, you know, to work with. And he's just like, change this. Here's my painting. Can you just adjust a few things here and there? And it's like such a nice person to work with. Like it was really, really fun to to work with those guys, you know? Yeah, that, oh, man, I just, like it's the the thought that goes into some of that stuff. And like, I wasn't sure if, especially seeing your demo reel, you can see sort of like, you know, you're definitely thinking outside the box, you know? So it was kind of like, how much of that is coming from you and how much of that is coming from them? And that one, a lot of it's coming from them. Uh, we're just kind of executing it in 3d, you know? So like a lot of them were like looking at old Russian um, stop motion animation type of stuff. And then mixing it with the surreal, surreal stuff and kind of having like the nice mixture. Some stuff worked, some stuff didn't. That was one of those projects that we were doing in between movies. 
Mm-hmm. So whenever we had like a little bit of downtime, we'll work on it and then forget about it and then come back to the next movie. So it was one of those like long probably like a year project or six months project that just kind of we did on, on, on the background, you know, as we're, we're like, we're waiting for the next movie to give us new stuff. We worked on it for a week and then continue on. So it was a, it was a long front project. So this might be, do you have to, did they have to license that art from you or is it just kind of a, we pay you to do this and we're good. We, we pay you to do that. It's kind of like the movies, you know, like we don't own any of it. That's why it's kind of hard to share also a lot of the video stuff mm-hmm. or where we share it because it's like, well, we don't know the rights to it. We have to get permission I to see. be able to show that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cause it's like, cause I'm pretty, cause I've only seen them once in concert and I'm pretty sure they used some of that imagery. Yeah. Yeah. They, they did. Yeah. So, Cause they, they used it for, I think we did a version that they will put in the background mm-hmm. while we, uh, while they were playing music because uh they were really cool they gave us gave us tickets to go to their concert and check all that stuff hang out behind the scenes with them and it was really cool man it's like man i was a big fan of tool as well so it was just kind of like weird it's like dude I, I know these guys like you know and i sometimes see them at conventions and they still remember oh yeah you're the guy that helped us do this and that and it's like hey how are you guys doing you that's know? awesome ah oh, man because yeah. i just know that it's like they're just artistically their sensibilities are Told there, it's like they don't they don't think about how to market anything, yet, you know that comes way later. Their artistic yeah, they vision. just do their thing. They just do what they want, and then hopefully it just kind of works out later, and it does, you know. Right, their artistic vision is like that's paramount. That that is what they want first, and I just I find that I guess it's it's freeing in a way for them, I'm sure, but it's at the same time for us, it's like we know that we're getting something that comes from not a place of how are we going to sell this and how are we going to market this, you know? Right. It comes from the art, right? It could yeah. just, it's directly from the artist to the public, as opposed to like getting watered down somewhere and, Oh, I don't think it's too dark or whatever, or, right. or it's not going to work. And it's like, no, we just make it and people are going to love it or they're not, you know? Right. There's a, I guess that's it. That's there's that purity to it, which I just think is amazing. Um, yeah. Now, Here's a question that came up after I even, you know, we had emailed back and forth. Um, a question that I came that came up and it was like your VR using VR for your 3D. Are you still doing that? Is that still something that Yes. You're... Yeah, so the, I do that and I, I don't post a lot of it. I'm actually going to start maybe doing streams just on that and it's a just I experiment with any type of medium that I can, you know, because it's like I I do sculpting on the iPad. I'm not sure if you've seen some of yeah. those posts. Mm-hmm. Um, because now you can, which is awesome. And then I also do VR. Now, ever since the VR headsets came out with a sculpting program, I only use it for that. I don't even play any games on it. Um, it's just so different because there's no, it's not like clay where you could actually touch it. You just have these remotes uh, that you just put on and yeah. you kind of fake touch things, you know? Yeah. So is it like, what model is it? Is it the the, the Oculus rift for the yeah the oculus the oculus the latest oculus rift uh not not the wireless one with the the one with the cable still yeah yeah the quest yeah. is it's what really i good. have yeah the quest is nice it's, it's nice because you could just go anywhere but with this one still requires because of the sculpting it requires a lot of computational you know power well, well that and i would think that with the limitations of the hardware on the quest you wouldn't be able to get really fine detail or as as fine detail as you could with with the the rift but then again, I haven't even messed with it, so I wouldn't even know how. Like I'm, I'm, I can envision kind of how it works because you see a lot of those. I don't know if you've you've probably seen these videos of people that paint in 3D. You know, it's the same type of thing. So, so yeah. it's a different way of sculpting than the way I would do ZBrush and the way I would do clay. That's the reason I started getting into it because it's more like you're sculpting with, um, like from the inside out. Instead of sculpting the surface that you're seeing, mm. you're sculpting through the inside of the surface and poking it out, you know? So it's, almost it's also like- sculpting, like, when you first try it, it's also sculpting, like, with uh, shaving cream. Because it, it, the, the brush, when it's releasing the polygons or whatever, it sounds like shaving cream. So you have to get used to that. It takes about a week for you to really be like, this, where is this going, you know? Right. See, that's it's almost like... A, the, the way that you describe that, is very textural to me. Like um, it's almost like being in the inside of like a two liter bottle 
or something, and you're they're pushing out the forms. Is that is that kind of how? Exactly. It's it's that you're pushing out the forms, and then now that they have updated, there's there's layers, so you could push different layers throughout. You know, some less, some more, and then and then blend them all together. So it's it's really amazing. I highly recommend it for any artist to to try. You know. Yeah, and like you said, there's probably a little bit of a a learning curve, and then of course the whole. Does it? Did you you said that? Uh, now, I guess the the video that I'd watch when you were talking about it, you kind of had to do it in spurts because, you know, you you get kind of like yes, if you got well, used to that. Well, my eyes get tired. Your, your eyes get tired, and you could you could lose track of where you're standing. Yeah. You know, you could end up at like further five feet away or whatever. So I I only do it like about an hour, forty minutes to an hour at a time, and then mm-hmm. I take like fifteen minute break and come back, uh, just because it does put some strain on your eyes compared to like just having a screen. Right. Now, the, one of the things that you had said on one of these interviews was that, you know, you know, oh, I did this in 30 minutes or I did this in whatever. And it's almost like you wanted to finish the model before you had to quit, before you knew you're, you're, you know, kind of in a, in a way, it's almost like your body's letting you down because <laughs> it's like, it's like, yes, oh my yes. gosh. So is that something that you do in like, like on your own, do you do you put limitations on yourself to see how far you can get in, this, in like a specific amount of time? Yes, and that's one thing that I recommend to all the like everybody that I'm kind of mentoring is like, do a project, time yourself. It took me a day, it took me three days, whatever, right? And next time you try to do something similar, cut it in half. And then from there, next time cut it in half. And eventually you will get to the point where you can't cut it in half anymore. But that's how you kind of start getting your speed if you're if it's about speed, you know. Yeah. So I try to time myself. I all these projects that I do in VR, I try not to spend more than one hour, maybe two hours at tops, because I want to just make sure that I can get as much done as I can within that hour and not noodle things where it's not going to matter, you know. Yeah. Um. Give me just a second here. Uh, yeah. We're saying that there's uh the picture is frozen. Um. Do a refresh because everything is showing excellent on my end. Um, I've got full, I've got a full, I mean, I'm moving my hands. Everything's fine on my end. So maybe, maybe do a quick refresh, go out and come back in. Um, that threw me off. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) it's all good. No. Um, so let me ask this just from a, like a personal standpoint, I'm a big keyboard guy. So when I'm going for speed, because I used to work in Excel, not not beautiful, not exciting, but I got to where I knew all of those keyboard shortcuts and I was zooming around Excel and people are like, well, how are you doing all this? I can't even follow what you're doing. Do you do, you do that? And then do you have to, I assume that you kind of have to slow, make yourself slow down like on stream and stuff, right? Yes, yes, because, uh, well, I'm not a huge shortcut guy. Mm. That's one thing that people are like, well, you're fast. How can you not be a shortcut guy? Like, I know just the basics. I don't go deeper into those levels because software changes so much for me that mm. um, that I don't want to learn all these keys and then I have to go to another software. And now the keys are different. So I try to stay pretty basic. But yeah, I do tend to slow down when I'm streaming because people ask questions or like, they're like, what did you just do? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, because I just do it out of muscle memory. Um, you know, like doing certain things. So I have to like explain, oh, I'm grabbing this brush and doing this and this is what I'm changing. But yeah, I do have to slow down a bit. (laughs) Yeah, I would think that, especially when you're trying to train somebody, I mean, it's the same thing when I was trying to train people what I was doing. It was the same sort of thing where I kind of had to, I had to go, okay, how would a normal person (laughs) who's trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B, how do I show them in a way that makes sense? And then it's almost like, in a way, it's almost like, uh, yeah, you can teach the kid how to use it, how to do something on, on the calculator, but you also need to learn how it works, you know, do it by hand so that you can, you know, it's, it's like video games again, you know, back to video games yeah. where, if you change all of your key binds on this crazy video game that's, that uses every key on the keyboard, every time they update, you've got to do that every time. That's got to be like, ah. Well, for me, one of the biggest problems was that when I'm teaching people or helping people at work, I have to go to their machine. So mm. their shortcuts are all different. So I, I'm like, I try to keep it with just the basics so that every time I go somewhere, I could just get up and running. I'm supposed to be like, learn their shortcuts or 
or right. here's these other shortcuts right. that I'm used to. And now I have to program those in, you know, that it became sense. one of those things. So I kind of just like, I just know the basics. I can get those done. You can learn those quickly because they're almost similar in every program. But then if you want to go deeper into your own thing, then that's fine. You know? Now, so ZBrush is, is that, is that your main, I guess you program that you use or do you use? No, that Maya is actually my main program that I use. It's oh. mostly Maya and ZBrush is more like the, like the assistant, you know, to it, like, like the creation part and then take it to Maya and then take it back to ZBrush. So it's like a back and forth mm. type of thing. Interesting. Cause that's like with a, with a lot of sound stuff, it's the same way. You can't just use one program. You kind of have to, you know, one program is specifically made for this kind of element and then you take it over here and you mess with it again over here and it's that's interesting yeah that's the same thing that's why i, I want to start my own stream I, I started doing some tests in the last couple of weeks so that i can introduce more of a maya stuff and also vr stuff because obviously in the streaming that i do or pixel logic they're the creators of zbrush so they're, i'm only doing zbrush stuff you know well that um definitely i i want to know what those are because i mean even if i'm not there to learn per se it's still entertaining to watch. That's the weird, I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that was your goal, but at least for me, I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm learning about him. I'm learning about what he does, but this is just relaxing. This is fun to watch. So, and that's what I try to do, right? When I do these streams, I want it to be, you're just here and you're just hanging out and like, you could ask me questions. We could talk about other things. We could talk about werewolves or aliens <laughs> and I'm still just kind of going through things. And like, it's not like, there's no pressure, you know, like you could come and hang out and leave any time and you won't miss anything. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I, I love that. Now, uh, do you already have that channel set up? And if so, what what is it? Yeah, it's, it's MagVFX on Twitch. Oh, So it's okay. the same, same thing, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I was gonna change it to something else, but people already know me as MagVFX and most of my social media things, I just kind of kept it the same. Right. Yeah, so did the Biomac come first or the MagVFX? Biomac came first, that was okay. like my, since high school, so I just kind of <laughs> kept it going, and I couldn't find the Magby effects on Twitter, so I just kind of kept that. <laughs> right. Well, um, I guess I mean that's. I feel like we we've, kind of covered everything that, that I wanted to. Oh wait, no, I do have one more thing, and this this might be a big one. So all right, we had talked about the volume many times on this show because from my perspective, working the way I did on on that the game chasers movie which by the way uh any of you you know miguel wasn't working on the 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 game chasers movie but what was interesting was that we were talking a lot about the way that things were done on that versus the way it's going to have to be done post covid and the mandalorian the way that they did it with the volume is that there's you know and this is for people that don't already know it's basically 270 degree video screens and video screens on top and what that does is allows for smaller crews because there's no lighting needed. The lighting is done via those images. And then when the camera moves, everything moves in the on the background with that kind of that parallax action. So that if a person's standing in the middle and the camera is panning as they're kind of walking, the background is panning with that same effect on the screens on the back. So from your perspective, you know, working in, in CG and all of this stuff. How does, how do you think that that's going to affect the future of filmmaking? Or do you, do you even think that it's going to be a thing? No, that's definitely the future way, the way things are going to be done. It's just, uh, you need less people. You could see everything on the fly. And if we, you say you want to change the environment or add a dinosaur or, or add whatever, you could visually see it there. And it, it's reflecting the, you know, the lighting and the shadows on you. So why wouldn't you use it? Especially Mandalorian is the perfect example of how it well it works, you know? Yeah, and I had no idea watching it. Like, I'm one I of those... Think it, I think if it just make more light stages like that all around the world, then, you know, anybody can just go there and start making your own films and you don't even have to be in the same location. Now, how does that affect your workflow, though? Like, or do you think that maybe there'll be a... Um, maybe there'll be a, a I guess, a, a production house that focuses more on the, on the, almost like the pre, -pro it's kind of like pre-production in a way, because it's, I would think that the pipelines would be different 
You know what I'm saying? They're pretty similar. They're pretty similar, actually. It's just a matter of putting it into a game engine and having mm -hmm. the game engine just have updates. You know, so when you have replaced this rock with a better rock, you just swap it out, and now all of a sudden it's in the same place. So you're not con con uh, creating the world again. You're just kind of updating it as things get better. You know. Well, does so I think it's uh, it's about the same. Okay, I was gonna say I would think that because there would probably be uh, there's probably situations in the Mandalorian where they filmed. And they had their, you know, whatever background they had. And then later on down the road, they're like, we really want something in the background there. You know, that's not, you know what I mean? Just a bunch of, you know, kind of after the fact, just adding stuff. I would think that that yeah, would... Yeah, you could totally do that. You could totally just post that on top because you already know the dimensions and where things are living in space and, the, you know, and all that stuff. So it's like, oh, just place it in front or behind that and you're already good, you know? And I just, it's it's one of those things that's like, as a kind of a tech geek and i love seeing how things are made it's very exciting but it's also kind of scary for some of those people that work in the industry that like set designers i mean why would you need well set the thing is that they just have to pivot you know they just have to adapt to it and then move with the technology and that's where a right. lot of people like they don't want to move from like 2d animation to 3d animation to like mm. visual effects and all. so you either pivot or you become a dinosaur and die you know that's a big thing and you always have to constantly keep learning so you just adapt to those things. Maybe you start using more VR sets to create your environment and show people that before you put it on the screen. So it's just a matter of updating your skills. It's not a right. like finding something from scratch, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, that's a definitely a good way to look at it because, I mean, I just, I guess my thing is that you've got, like, for example, Leon, you know, who's basically just worked on huge, huge, you know, Game of Thrones and things like that, where there's these huge sets and we need you to go put smoke over there on that hill over there. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be, I think there's still going to be roles that are going to be lost, you know? And so, I mean, it's, but then there's going to be new roles that are going to be created, you know? So it's like, uh, like you take away from one and you add to the other. So you just kind of have to pivot or, or just right. stop doing this, you know? I, and see, I guess that's what we need. <laughs> we need more like I guess ways to look at it where it's, this is a positive, this is a net positive because we're going to keep people safer for one, you know, cause there's not going to be, you know, 150 people on a set all crammed together in this little bitty space. You can really, I, I see the benefit to it. Definitely. Um, I just, I guess my, that's my thing is like, I'm wondering how other people in the industry are, are seeing this and going, wow, we can, we can totally streamline this whole process because we don't have to have build this whole set. We build it in 3D in a game engine. Now, how does, um, and for those of you that may not be, you know, super geeky into like video games and things like this, this may mean nothing to you, but the new Unreal Engine that came out, the, I guess the announcement for that, how did, the, did, did that like, did you go, okay, whoa, that was... Like, were you impressed well, by it, that? It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Like the, the, the nice thing is that it's just blurring the, the, the line between movies and games, you know, mm -hmm. like now we're working in the same software. We're just making the quality the same now. And now that you could have millions of polygons in high quality detail that you're going to be able to see real time where before it was impossible and also have ray tracing and all that stuff, you know? So I think it just makes it where like now there's more opportunities to make alien worlds and alien, you know, anything like now, you could really make something look photo real in, in a matter of seconds, you know? It's, it really is amazing. And then, you know, you see certain, I don't know what you would call, I guess they're like landmark type games or, you know what I mean? Like, like for, for me, Last of Us 2 is some of the, the design in that game and the way that, you know, you know, you, you shine a, a, a flashlight on the wall, but that light is bouncing off the wall onto the, the ground and then if there's a puddle there, the reflection of that light and the way that it changes and affects the entire room is in real time is unbelievable for a PS4. You know what I mean? Yes, just... and you could just imagine the possibility, like the, the last one that just came out, right? The last of us, the yeah. whatever the, this last one, like now they have breathing, like if they're actually running, their breathing actually changes. And you're like, what? Like, this is impossible. Like, how is that even possible? But it's, it's there now that that's, more realism, you know, adding the ray tracing and the bounce lights and all this stuff, it's going to feel like a real movie soon, you know? Well, I don't, but you're I mean, in it. Yeah, if it, uh, I don't know how much you've seen or played of that game, but oh my God, that game is 
it's scary how good it is. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. I feel like, and then we've got deep fakes to worry about. Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, so it's like, wow. And then, but the crazy part is that you can do this off from home now. Like you can do this, like technically, like if you had the computer and you had the time, you can do this, you know, like you don't have to go to a special facility and be top secret. It's like, you can actually blog about this or you could do your own film on this, you know? Yeah. And that, and here's, here's something interesting too. I mean, it's probably not, you know, it's not visual, it's audio. Oh my gosh. Some of the stuff that I'm able to do in, in this software that I've got, that I'm working on the sound, the sound design, it's like, I really, I literally feel like I'm in the future because it's like, I can, there's a recording, for example, I can delete a bird without affecting the rest of the audio at all. So the ambient noise outside, the, you know, the, just the sound of being outside, you hear this, it's not just a dead, quiet, still thing. I can go in and remove a bird sound without affecting somebody's dialogue. That's the funny part. Uh, you're, like right now, I'm not sure if you're running RTX, um, the sound thing. Uh, the no, company no, that no. I work for in video created this sound thing for streaming and for, I'm running it now. So basically it only captures my voice, no matter whether there's a fan or somebody opens a door, it, all those things are muted. It's only my voice that you're hearing, you know? So that's, and it's free and it's, you could download, anybody could download it. So it makes it so much, it's so, so amazing, you know, that you can isolate things like that. And then, yeah. And I, I'm going to have to look into that seriously, because that's one of the things that I'm constant. I'm, I live, there's an airport like two miles away, months further than that, but it's, I'm in the flight line. So every now and oh, then you got to use this thing. You got to, you got to oh, yeah. download it. It works with your, your computer. It's amazing. Cause you literally, you could have a blower happening or you could have other things, noises happening and it's just isolating your voice. That's I was cool. literally, I have a fan pointing straight at the, at the <laughs> mic hitting me and you don't hear it. Right? No. Wow. Okay. Wow. I'm, I, I'm definitely going to have to learn about that. Yeah. Yeah. Look into it. It's a RTX voice. It's uh RTX just look voice. that up and you'll be amazed. Cool. Cause I mean, I know that there's, you know, there's noise gates and things like that, but you're talking about something that's it's actually doing like real time isolation. Yeah, this is real time, like like real time stuff, which is amazing. You know. Wow. And then that's another the, one of the other things that is very scary about that software that I'm using is that you can change somebody's performance. You can change the inflection of somebody's voice. Like if you say oh. somebody somebody said that like a question, you know, and I don't want it to sound like it was a question. I want it to sound like it was a statement. You can actually change their performance to where it goes. You know, like instead of, you know, That's cool. like, what do you think? You know, but it, I want to change yeah. it. Up. What do you think? I can change the way he says it. And in many cases, the actor wouldn't even know because it's like they might, but they might go, huh, I don't remember performing it that way, but they can't tell because it's their voice. I'm just changing the pitch and the inflection. It's I'm like, okay. Yeah. This deep fake stuff is getting scary. Uh, <laughs> yeah, even deep fake, right? You could do it all yourself. Like literally, you could you could do it from home. It's a, it's pretty amazing. That I mean, it's scary, but it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I think I'm I've I've gone gone through all the questions that I wanted to ask. Is there anything that you wanna that you wanna plug or anything like that? Of course, Labestia. I mean, gosh. Um, yeah, check out the best. Yeah, check out MagVFX and the streams. Uh, you know, if you guys have questions after the fact, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I guess my main thing is just like, I guess make mistakes. Don't be scared to make mistakes. That's the biggest thing, you know. Don't be scared to make the mistakes so you can get better quicker. I think that's the main mentality behind what I try to help people with. You know, I think that's good for anything. Don't be afraid to 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 screw up. And then when you screw up, don't you know. Maybe, maybe just make, make sure you tell the truth about it. Cause sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that's what, that'll get you in, in even more trouble. Cause you're like, you're trying to hide it. But anyway, right. right. Yeah. Be truthful. Oh God. And be yourself too, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, Miguel, thank you for coming on. Uh, this was, I mean, this was amazing for me because like I said, I've been, you know, admiring your work for the last two weeks here. And then I learned, wow, I've been admiring your work for years and didn't even know it. So again, thank you for coming on. It was, it was just an honor to have you on. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Of course. And guys, um, if you have any questions again, reach out to him, magvfx.com. He's got his Instagram there in chat. Um, 
again, thank you again. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time. Bye, guys. See you.